Michael Mukasey served as the 81st Attorney General of the United States. As the nation's chief law enforcement officer, he advised the Department of Justice on issues of domestic and international law. Prior to that, he served as a judge of the Southern District of New York for 18 years and as its chief for six of those years. He is currently of counsel in a New York-based law firm, and his practice has included proceedings before various international tribunals. It's a pleasure to have you there, here with us today. It's good to be with you. We've just seen the 20th anniversary of the September 11, 2001 attack by Islamist terrorists on the United States. And we've noted both what was said and what was not said about that event. It seems at least a sad burden to have to take also notice also of the United Nations celebration, if that's what it is, of the 20th anniversary of the UN World Conference Against Racism held in Durban, South Africa, that actually concluded a few days before 9-11. But we must take note of it and at least comment on some relationship between the two events and on what they mean both for Israel and for the United States. As many of you know, the original Durban conference became a poisonous forum for the expression of anti-Semitism. This took place not only at the part of the conference that was run by non-governmental organizations that had consistently slandered Israel as a racist society, including the Human Rights, including Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and others, but also at that part of the conference that was run by participating governments. The atmosphere was such that the delegations of both the United States and Israel walked out when it became clear that they could not prevent the final document issued by the, by the governments at the conference, the Durban Declaration, from singling out Israel with the slander that it engages in racist oppression of Palestinians. The declaration said under the heading, Victims of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia and Related Intolerance, at paragraph 63, that, quote, we are concerned about the plight of the Palestinian people under foreign occupation, unquote. No state other than Israel is named as engaged in racially victimizing anyone. In 2011, on the 10th anniversary of the Durban Conference, an attempt was made, coinciding with the convening of the General Assembly in September of that year, to resuscitate the Durban Declaration. And this time, more than a dozen countries, including the United States, England, and France, the three democracies that hold permanent seats on the Security Council, refused to participate. This year again, on the 20th anniversary of the Durban Conference, an attempt is being made in the United Nations to call for the, quote, full and effective implementation of the Durban Declaration as set forth in a resolution, resolution of the General Assembly in December, 2020. The resolution that was adopted by the General Assembly in December says that, that quote, the meeting will adopt a short and concise political declaration aimed at mobilizing political will at the national, regional, and international levels for the full and effective implementation of the Durban Declaration and program of action and its follow-up processes. In other words, the outcome, according to this resolution, is already set. There may be a discussion, but there will be a political declaration issued supporting the Durban Declaration. This year again, the United States, the UK, and France are among the several countries that will not participate in this commemoration of the Durban Conference. That is, I suppose, the good news. However, this year's event and the non-participation of the United States and other democracies do not exist in a vacuum. For one thing, one is tempted to ask, how come the Durban Declaration is such a hardy perennial at the United Nations as to emerge like the locusts regularly and at long intervals? For one thing, 
the UN has consistently funded non-governmental organizations that promote BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions directed at a member state, Israel, and have close ties to the terrorist organizations PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and Hamas, to the tune of about $40 million from 2016 to 2020 alone. Indeed, the United Nations itself has become a favorite venue for the promotion of anti-Semitism. Although early Zionists believed that the establishment of a state for Jews would end anti-Semitism, in part because it would provide a refuge, the United Nations has turned that belief on its head by making Israel itself the focus of anti-Semitism. In addition, the past few years have seen outright genocide committed by at least one member state, China, against its Uyghur Muslim population, with no UN resolution condemning, it, condemning that behavior, despite the energetic efforts supposedly to condemn racism that surround the 20th anniversary of the Durban Conference. Yet another piece of evidence, if one were needed, that the point of all this isn't to condemn racism and discrimination, but rather to condemn Israel. For a third and perhaps more ominous thing, although the United States has refused to participate in the Durban commemoration, it has re-engaged more broadly with the United Nations bodies that focus on condemning and isolating Israel for supposedly oppressive and racially motivated act actions, and has made statements to its representative that at least call into question how far the United States is in fact distancing itself from the Durban Declaration and from the commemoration itself. Thus in February, Secretary of State Blinken announced that the Biden administration intends to rejoin the ironically named UN Human Rights Council, whose members include such human rights paragons as China, Cuba, Russia, Somalia, and Venezuela, and whose output has consisted substantially of baseless accusations and condemnations of Israel, while downplaying the conduct of countries that systematically oppress minorities within their borders, such as China, or their citizens at large, such as Iran. In March, the United States representative to the Human Rights Council delivered a statement for which the United States had lobbied to get the support of more than 150 nation states, a statement that spoke of, quote, recalling the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, unquote. Now, because the Durban Declaration singled out Israel for attack, obviously Israel could not sign the statement that the United States had promoted. So apart from the message delivered by the statement itself, it had the effect of isolating Israel, which could not sign it. It is in fact obvious, but sometimes the obvious has to be made specific as well, that the maneuvering that surrounds the commemoration of the Durban Conference and the constant drumbeat of criticism of Israel that emanates from the UN Human Rights Council are of a piece. They are part of an ongoing campaign to delegitimize Israel, the only Jewish state in the world. This has included attempts to deny the historic connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel, and to portray the establishment of Israel as essentially a consolation prize to make up for the Holocaust, which many anti-Semites still deny or minimize, rather than a recognition of the historic connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel going back thousands of years. Indeed, these efforts have gone so far as to condone the destruction of archeological evidence of that connection and to deny the validity of the objective evidence that has survived. I suggested at the beginning of these remarks that there's a connection between the 20th anniversary of the September 11 attack on the United States and the attempt by the UN to reinvigorate Durban pronouncements of 20 years ago. It's been said that Jews are the canary in the coal mine in the sense that what happens to Jews gives warning to everybody else of what's in store for them. The malign influence of Durban threatens our own pluralistic society in the United States. 
We've already seen calls in the Human Rights Council and elsewhere for an investigation into racism in the United States. Now we certainly have our faults and we have our problematic history in this country. But the notion that we should be investigated by nations that commit genocide or practice slavery or both simply ought not to be suffered by the country whose citizens still enjoy the highest level of freedom and prosperity in the history of the world. The time for not only Israel, but also the United States to stand against this is now. And the United States, as the host and major funding source for the UN, is in a position to do something about it. That something is to step up and call out the pronouncements of Durban and the like for what they are, and to provide no support, political or financial, to the bodies that issue them. Thank you very much. The commitments made in the Durban Declaration and Program of Action as the comprehensive framework for action against racism, racial discrimination, and xenophobia, alongside with the CERD, CERD should constitute the roadmap for combating all forms of racism and intolerance. Mr. Chairman, it is a matter of serious concern that Israel, as the only apartheid regime of the 21st century, unabatedly continues to violate all basic human rights of Palestinians. The appalling racial prejudice can be found in every facet of Israeli life. This regime poses a real and urgent threat to the global fight against racism, xenophobia, and intolerance. Professor Ruth Weiss is Professor Emeritus at Harvard University, where she taught for 21 years. She is a noted scholar of Yiddish literature and of Jewish history and culture. In 1992, she published a visionary work entitled, If I Am Not For Myself, The Liberal Betrayal of the Jews. Among her many honors, she is the recipient of the National Humanities Medal and multiple awards for literature and scholarship from around the world. Her latest book, Free as a Jew, a personal memoir of national self-liberation is hot off the press. Thank you for joining us, Ruth. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, the United Nations was founded in October, 1945 on the ashes of the Second World War. And that's why its charter opens with the statement, we, the peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. And there followed a succession of splendid resolutions to reaffirm faith in the fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and here's to our point of nations large and small, and it goes on in that vein. The founders of the UN were determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And the UN was founded also on the ruins of the League of Nations that had similarly pledged to promote international cooperation and to achieve peace and security. One would have expected that the failure of the earlier international organization would have demanded first and foremost a complete post-mortem since far from preventing another world war, the League had actually within two decades allowed for a second world war that was more destructive than the first. Given this record, those administering the new entity might have studied what had gone wrong before attempting the same thing again on an even more grandiose scale. How and at what points had the League of Nations failed to prevent the escalating aggression? What were its sins of omission 
And what about the sins of commission? Could that international body actually have allowed for greater aggression? Because if the League of Nations had facilitated a world war far worse than the one that had called for its creation, was it not possible that the same process could repeat itself in even more violent form? If unexamined history has a habit of repeating itself, could a United Nations incentivize genocide? This is the question before us, and it has ceased to be a question. One of the thorniest issues to come before the United Nations at the moment of its founding was the political fate of the world's most targeted minority, the Jewish people. The same issue had come before the League of Nations, and we know what happened then. The results are commemorated in Holocaust museums. The moral and political betrayal by the British was especially striking since they had been given the mandate over Palestine and they better than anyone appreciated the Jewish right to the land of Israel. And yet they had forcibly kept the Jews from entering their homeland when it could have made all the difference. When the UK finally admitted failure, and handed the problem over to the United Nations, the British did not even have the courage to vote for partition. Now the vote on the partition of Palestine on November the 29th, 1947 seemed to change that uh, tide. To be sure the partition map uh, was a disaster. But when the 33 nations sanctioned the creation of a Jewish state, there was reason to hope that the United Nations would prove more effective than its predecessor. The creation of Israel was both a symbolic check on the evil of the world and a practical step in the settlement of material claims and of refugees. That the two dominant countries, the United States and the Soviet Union, should both have found reason to support the resolution almost made up for the fact that the United Kingdom did not. The General Assembly vote on the partition of Palestine once seemed as hopeful as the branch that Noah's dove brought back to the ark after the flood, but that did not last very long. In 1945, the Arab League formed simultaneously with the United Nations in obvious opposition to its platform. The Arab League arose as the expression of Arab and Muslim aspirations. Yet the only unifying element among the seven countries that founded uh, the Arab League, soon to be joined by another 15, was common opposition to the existence of Israel. The Arab members of the UN made no secret of their militancy. They attacked Israel at the moment of its creation. And when they failed to destroy it, they refused to sue for peace. The of millions of subjects and tens of thousands of square miles and exportable sources of energy and their political clout gave them the most preposterous odds of any previous conflict in history. So where was the UN's commitment to the equal rights of nations, large and small? How could Arab rejectionist countries that refuse to coexist with a fellow country be allowed to remain members in good standing of an international organization pledged to prevent the scourge of war. Now that was the first failure. The UN never marshaled any punitive measure against nations that violated its fundamental principle of mutual recognition. The Arab bloc remained confident that it could go on aggressing against Israel while remaining members in good standing of the organization that forbade such aggression. Let's be clear, this was not simply a regional war between two countries like Iran and Iraq, India and Pakistan, or any of the dozens of other territorial and political conflicts. This was a religious ideological attempt at genocide to wipe out the Jewish nation that had recovered its homeland. The Jews wanted only the acceptance that was owed them and guaranteed them by the UN. The Arab countries expelled Jewish residents from their midst 
while simultaneously trying to erase their place of refuge. And the UN condoned this behavior, setting an example for the rest of the world. Now, step two then followed. Since Israel represented the democratic model of civilization, other non-democratic nations joined the Arabs in their war. A Soviet-Arab alliance was forged within the United Nations around common opposition to Israel. This actually replicated the situation in Europe beginning in the 1920s, when Hitler and the Nazis used anti-Semitism as the common denominator to win over and dominate countries of Europe. Only now, opponents of the Jewish state had a huge advantage over Nazism in Europe. Anti-Zionism claimed the UN as its forum. In 1975, the Arab and Soviet blocs passed a resolution at the United Nations reversing the principles on which it was founded. This was resolution 3379, defining Zionism as racism. Again, let's be clear, by 1975, racism had overtaken imperialism and colonialism as liberalism's greatest term of condemnation. If Israel was now the only country accused of racism for the sin of its existence, then the resolution was a new warrant for genocide. Yet there it stayed on the record for 16 years until the United States succeeded in having it repealed. For 16 years until 1991, this hateful slogan was spread over parts of the world that had never known a Jew. For 16 years, the United Nations sanctioned and disseminated the idea of Israel's illegitimacy and delinquency. Now, Israel's foreign minister welcomed the repeal of the resolution as, quote, a great moral victory for the UN and injustice was rectified, end of quote. Rectified? Really? What did the UN then do to undo the damage of this horrifying accusation? Does an ideology that has been pumped into the international community evaporate without leaving a trace? The UN did not spend a penny or a moment trying to undo the enduring evil that it had released. Does anyone think that those leveling this malicious charge against the Jewish people stopped doing so? And so, of course, the next step was bound to follow. In 2001, when the World Conference Against Racism was held in Durban, South Africa, the snowballing anti-Israel coalition used this occasion to consolidate its gains and expand its influence even further. Some people asked, how could a conference against racism turn into a hate fest against the Jewish state? Well, given the UN's never atoned for, never corrected association of racism with Israel, the one and only Israel, the question was rather, how could it not have turned into a hate fest against the Jewish state? The Durban Conference was conceived as an African-Asian claims conference against the West. Many attending countries were themselves abusers of human rights, some still practiced slavery, many tolerated forms of racial and ethnic suppression, but the term racism was used there as it has come to be used now in America as an accusation against those who had actually repudiated racism and guaranteed their citizens equal opportunity. Since the United Nations had turned the Zionism racism equation into an article of faith, Israel became the primary target of Durban's grievance and blame. Now our convener, Anne Bayevsky, and many of the speakers will describe the great harm that Durban conferences have done to the actual cause of human rights. I want to highlight the role of its sponsor, the international body, the United Nations, in first failing to arrest, then allowing to develop, and finally becoming the chief promoter of the most viral and deadly form of racism, the demonization of Jews. Fortunately, parts of the Arab Muslim Middle East have begun to accept the principle of coexistence. 
That is very fortunate. But this has happened outside and despite the United Nations. And what was once merely a theoretical question, can a world organization devoted to peace actually incentivize genocide can now be answered in the affirmative. The Durban conferences confirm that the United Nations has become a menace to the international order that it promised to secure. We no longer expect it to prevent the scourge of war, but we do have a job. Our job is to limit the UN's incitement to war against Israel and against other peacekeeping nations. Thank you. The Syrian Arab Republic firmly condemns the attempts by Israel and occupying force to uh, stop the collective uh, identity of the Palestinian people. We condemn this illegal practice that goes against all values of freedom, democracy and humanity. It's a law that shows a clear message to the international community, namely that the uh, occupying state is an apartheid state. Baroness Ruth Deeth is a member of the House of Lords in the United Kingdom. She was appointed a life peer in 2005 and sits as a crossbench legislator. She was the principal of St. Anne's College, Oxford for 13 years and chair of the Bar Standards Board from 2009 to 2015. Patron and trustee of multiple Jewish organizations and institutes, she is a heroine, a courageous voice in the House of Lords against anti-Semitism in all its forms. Her father escaped the Nazis while other members of her family perished in the Holocaust. Thank you so much for being with us today, Ruth. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be with you all today on this very special occasion. There are some cities that have no fame other than the tragedy they witnessed. Chernobyl, Auschwitz come to mind. Durban, 2001 has become a byword for the worst international behavior and the city itself will forever be thus labeled for exposing the real racists in our world. I'm glad to say that the United Kingdom will not participate in the upcoming conference, albeit that it took quite a few weeks of persuading before the decision was made. It could not be more apt that we are meeting right after the Afghanistan debacle and betrayal. The hopes that some of us have in relation to British policies towards Israel and the Middle East have been undermined by recent actions of the American administration that affect Israel but are echoed in the United Kingdom. The abandonment of Afghanistan in which the UK says it has no action, option but to comply. The return to funding UNRWA and the Palestinians which Britain has never stopped despite the overwhelming evidence of the hate handed on generation by generation in the way that Palestinian children are taught to obliterate Israel. The UK has not shown the moral muscle it should have done in the United Nations Human Rights Council to which the US is returning and the appeasement of Iran, which the UK is now emboldened to continue. We need to continue to press the United Kingdom to move its embassy to Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, and to use its representation on the body that funds UNRWA to get it to stop propagating hate literature. I'm very concerned that Israel will be pressured into acceding to a new Iran deal, not worth the paper it is written on. What Israel has learned from the last few months, what Jews and other persecuted minorities have learned, is that there is no one to defend them except themselves. The promises made by big powers are no longer to be relied on that the peace and humanitarian missions of the UN and international bodies are either ineffective or skewed by partisan interests, that there is no moral compass in international affairs, 
How long will it be before Taliban Afghanistan takes its place in the General Assembly and on human rights committees? We've learned there is no real care in those international bodies for racist and misogynist behavior, no universal condemnation of barbarism and departure from the rule of law and the laws of warfare, no universal welcome for minorities or refugees. Only fear of brutality and fear of relativism is stalking the world right now. It is a world frightened to call out the terrible recent history of Islamists, the regimes of Saudi Arabia and other neighboring countries that subdue women, the kidnapping of children in Africa by Islamists, the terror waged by individual and group Islamist activities in Europe, the blanketing out of dissenting voices on religious matters, the trashing of education, by delivering it in a way that bolsters hate and death fantasies as done by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency and the Palestinian Authority in Gaza and the West Bank. It is a world where richer countries keep handing over taxpayers' hard-earned money to worthless regimes that we know will not pass the resource to those who need it, but will allow it to end up in the pockets of the rulers. It is a world that has at its center an international criminal court that criminalizes the innocent and listens to the guilty, as when it rules that Israel should be investigated for war crimes. It is a world that condemns an army that does its utmost to act morally and legally when provoked, but turns a blind eye or even praises terrorist and pointless activity from those who play the charade of underdog. That is the legacy of Durban 2001, and that is why it needs to be put to an end this year. Given that the United Nations, and in particular the Human Rights Council, serve as a cover and a distraction from the real racists and misogynists, and in order to deflect the claims for reparation for colonialism and slavery, many states are prepared to buy silence on this in return for focusing the issue of racism on Israel, the only state singled out in the original Durban Declaration as a colonialist oppressor. The Durban Declaration, which is said to be implemented in full at Durban 4 as its aim, recognized the slave trade as a source of modern racism and urged the consideration of reparations. From this flows the highlighting of the issues of slavery and its profits, colonialism, genocide, and ill treatment of black people today. It is a delicate matter to withdraw from Durban, but still to maintain a stance on settling these matters. It should be possible for democratic countries, including the United Kingdom, to be able to address genuine racism without scapegoating Jews, diverting negative attention to Jews and Israel, making some victims more important than others in relation to funding and public attention, or making minorities compete against each other in the victim mistakes. Sadly, we now know that the big powers will not pursue the sort of real anti-racist program that many of us would like to see in the Middle East, and that they might abandon their friends in their hour of need. Israel has to take care of itself and ignore any complaints that aim to weaken its self-defense. The Durban Declaration is the 21st century revival of the Zionism is racism slander, which was revoked by the General Assembly in 1991. It picks out the Palestinians as specific examples of victims of racism. Israel is the only country mentioned out of more than 190 world states in the declaration and the only country named as guilty of victimizing for racism. The effect of Durban has been to mainstream opportunities for the UN Human Rights Council and other bodies to allege that the Jewish state is a racist state and apartheid regime. In international fora, other minorities compete for recognition as the most oppressed, whereas there is no mention of anti-Semitism except recognition of its increase. Palestinians triumph by linking their own agenda to the apartheid racist theme, by appropriating the history of others and isolating Jews from their natural allies. The Durban phenomenon assists in the broader political goal of undermining Israel's legitimacy. Now Durban serves to misappropriate racism as a means of spreading anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism to another level. By clever wording, any attempt to discredit Durban 4 
on the grounds of anti-Semitism runs smack into the accusation that this would abandon efforts on behalf of people of African descent. The Durban strategy has two prongs. One, Palestinians portray their narrative as mirroring the history and experiences of people of African descent. Two, to be against Durban is to be racist, imperialist, and unsympathetic to the victims of racism. There is no way one can dissent from just a part of the declaration or alter it as it is adopted by consensus, ignoring changes and is already set. Canada and Australia dissented over the mention of Israel in the original 2001 declaration, but that was and still is published without mentioning that dissent. The problem with the UN is that a majority of undemocratic states are given the power by vote to decide the fate of free democratic states. Over and over again throughout the years, the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly avoid condemning Palestinian racism, worldwide misogyny, Syria and other Arab states' treatment and persecution of their Palestinian brethren and ethnic minorities, Afghanistan, China's persecution of the Uyghurs, war in Yemen, and so on. There's hardly a Muslim country in the world that is at peace and not persecuting some of its own citizens, foreign workers and minorities on racial, religious and ethnic grounds. For example, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Iran, Iraq, Tunisia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Niger, Turkey and Egypt. The innate perverse racism agenda of Durban has given rise to the current preoccupation of Western countries on the legacy of colonialism, pulling down statues, reparations, changing the educational and cultural curriculum. This way, the attack has been framed so as to cloak the rise in anti-Semitism, often deliberately. Modern discourse is of the Jews as white privileged oppressors, disqualified as victims, only seen as a threat. Those who believe that white supremacy is the greatest terrorist threat pay little attention to anti-Semitism on the left. When they're called out, they turn the justified accusers into villains. In Britain, where the Equality and Human Rights Commission has found the Labour Party to be institutionally anti-Semitic, this unprecedented finding has been largely ignored. On the contrary, those who accuse politicians of anti-Semitism, rightly, are told by Labour Party members that they are making up the accusation in order to silence anyone critical of Israel or to undermine the left wing. It is now accepted in the UK that when a black person complains of racism or a woman complains of sexual harassment, they should be believed for a start. This doesn't seem to apply to Jews who point out anti-Semitism. There is also silence here about the fact that a disproportionate number of the assaults on Jews in the UK come from Muslims. They are also responsible for attacking Christian targets. The fear of reprisal has made this subject taboo. This doesn't bode well for recognizing real terrorism in the Middle East. We know that work continues to make the word Zionism an unacceptable slur. In South Africa recently, a Jewish candidate for a post as a judge was questioned about his membership of the South African Board of Deputies. Why? Because it supports Zionism which is viewed as a discriminatory form of nationalism and because objections have been received from the Black Lawyers Association. That is how Durban has infected the rule of law on its own home ground. The last 20 years since Durban have seen anti-Semitism on the rise globally in the form of anti-Israelism. In general discourse about racism that never seems to include anti-Semitism. Those politicians who condemn all forms of racism, obliterate its unique status and the way it has transmogrified into hatred of Israel, a phenomenon described repeatedly by the late Chief Rabbi Sachs, who explained that anti-Semitism started as religious hatred, then it became ethnic hatred, and now hatred of the only Jewish state. Perverse world conferences like Durban give support to the rise in anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism in the UK and across Europe. Jewish minorities have never thrived in empires. And we know from experience that the best protection for Jews is their own country and self-defense. 
Fortunately, Brexit means that the UK can continue to provide a safe haven for the thousands of Jews fleeing the rest of Europe. And we can distance this country from the European Court of Justice ruling that the banning of kosher killing is legal. The legacy of Durban is that anti-Jewish or Israel racism is not counted as such and has almost become mainstream in social media and on campus. We are championing the adoption by campuses and other institutions of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which includes the statement that normal criticism of the Israel government, as one was criticised any other government, isn't anti-Semitism. But to call for the end of Israel or to compare it to Nazism does amount to anti-Semitism. It would be good to see the IHRA definition added to the Durban Declaration or any discussion of it to bring it back on a proper sane road. Thank you.